Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Friends, the Lord be with you and welcome to St John's Worship for this, the third Sunday of Easter. In today's service of the word, we will be reflecting on the story of Emmaus from Luke chapter 24. It's a story in which the disciples discover God not in the temple, but in their own hearts and homes. And so with that in mind, let's begin today's worship by acknowledging the presence of God with us wherever we are. And I invite you to repeat the words, Lord or Christ, have mercy after me at the end of each bidding. And so, united in the spirit, let us pray. Source of all being, we welcome you now into our hearts and homes. Bless this time of worship and unite us in your praise. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Risen Saviour, we hold before you anything which has separated us from you, your creation, our neighbours and ourselves this week. Heal us by the wholeness of your presence. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Life-giving Spirit, may the joy and the hope of Easter be made known in the very fragility and brokenness of our world. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We pray the collect for this, the third Sunday of Easter. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. And so I invite you now to listen as we hear words inspired by the story of Emmaus from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. The road to Jerusalem is normally heaving, but as we walked away from the city that day, Cleopas and I were completely alone with the dust and the disappointment. Couldn't believe he'd really gone. Not like that. The Romans give their dogs better ends than that. Mile after useless mile we walked, carrying a heavy silence between us. Even the dirt of the road felt silent, except for the bitter crunch of the odd bit of gravel or whatever. And the birds, Yes, the birds were singing their hearts out. At the time, I remember wondering how they could sound so happy, like it was all some big joke. I wanted to tell them, he's dead. It's over. Stop singing. Turns out I should have paid more attention to what they were telling me. <laughs> it caught us by surprise when a voice from behind broke the silence and asked to join us. God knows where he came from. We were even more surprised when he asked us what was wrong. How could anyone coming from Jerusalem not know? Mind you, he looked like he'd been sleeping under a hedge for three days. <laughs> Dead to the world, you might say. So we told him. Told him all about the so-called Messiah and how it had all gone wrong told him about the cold nails and the weeping women 
and the even colder tomb. Told him how it was just starting to sink in, when this morning some sick vandal broke in and took the body. Told him how it had tipped Mary and the other women over the edge, and how they'd started making up stories about seeing him come back to life. The others went and checked, but of course it was all made up. Can't blame them. It was too much for us as well. We couldn't face the grief and the confusion and the politics of it all anymore. So we just hit the road and started walking. If anything, we just wanted to hear someone talk about something else. We were sick of hearing the same news for three days solid, with no sign of any escape in the city. At that, he just laughed and called us a right pair of Muppets. And then he began to speak. Looking back, it was amazing. I've never really understood the Bible. It just sort of scrolls and rolls around my head. But it felt like he was finally untangling all that messy knot of scripture and weaving this beautiful new story around us, as if that's how it was always meant to be read. And somehow it, it all just made sense, all burning with this bright, simple love. Next thing we knew, we were back at the village, urging him to stay the night with us. He was all for carrying on, despite how dangerous it could be to leave the house. But eventually we convinced him to stay. At least, that's what he let us think anyway. Can't believe we fell for it. I didn't notice anything strange as we got inside and washed our feet. But as we sat around the battered old table, everything suddenly felt tense, like the whole house was waiting for something, and Cleopas' hand shook as he poured the wine. Then, calm as you like, he, the stranger, picked up the bread, and as soon as he touched it, the air began to crackle like it does before a storm. And as he broke it, everything burst into bright gold flames of joy. The bread in his hands, the grain of the table, the hearts in our chests. And suddenly his face lit up and I knew it was him, smiling his great big smile over the crusty old loaf. But as soon as I realised, it was over. He was gone. And we were left staring at each other, mouths open, in a room full of a silence like laughter waiting to erupt. Oh, and erupt it did. Whooping and cheering and chattering, we grabbed our sandals and rushed out into the evening air, air which was bursting with birdsong by that point. We must have run nearly the whole way back to the city, through the winding streets and up the staircase. When we arrived... The upper room was already full of people running back and forth and hugging and laughing for the sheer joy of it. And in the chaos, we sat at that other table where he had shared that other loaf. And everyone gathered around us in wonder as we began to tell them how he had been made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Friends, may we speak and hear in the name of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as I said, we've just heard words inspired by the story of the road to Emmaus from the Gospel of Luke. And I hope you don't mind me retelling the story in that way. But perhaps today or later on in the week you could turn to Luke 24, verses 13 to 35, and read that story again for yourselves. It's a beautiful story in its own right, but I think
think it speaks quite profoundly into our current situation as well and is worth a read. It's significant, isn't it, that uh, at the heart of the story there's this extraordinary encounter between the disciples and the risen Christ. But this encounter doesn't take place in Jerusalem with the priests in the temple or the disciples' friends in the marketplace or their leaders in the palace. Instead, the disciples encounter the risen Christ as they leave behind that holy place with all its familiar ways and people. They encounter him in a discussion with a stranger on the road, in the everyday act of breaking bread. They discover him in their own hearts, burning within them and in their own home. And of course, this is precisely what we are being not only invited, but actually forced to discover in our own lives at the moment. As we have to look for God, not in church or familiar ways of worshipping, but in our own prayer lives. And whilst I am longing for that day when we can gather together again in St John's to break bread around the altar, I wonder whether perhaps there's a gift or an opportunity at the moment as we are invited to cultivate and to nurture our own inner lives. Luckily for us, we have a long and experienced tradition behind us, which has a lot to say about how to go about doing just that. And so for those of you who maybe don't quite know where to begin praying at home, I've included in this week's newsletter two patterns of prayer which you might want to try. One is Lectio Divina, praying with scripture. And the other is called the Examine, a way of giving thanks for God's gifts and asking for God's help where we need it each day. And both of those are actually very simple forms of prayer which can be practised in the home, either alone or with family members. But even if that feels like too much for you, of course, praying at home can be as simple as saying thank you God when you get out of bed in the morning or the Lord's Prayer before bed at night. And so this week, I invite you all to make a prayer space at home. And that might be as simple as lighting a candle or uh, holding a cross. But just try making that space. And in that space, remember that the love of God is always already present. Always already, God is waiting to be recognised in our hearts and in our homes, like the risen Christ waiting at the table in Emmaus. And of course, I'm sure that actually many of you are much better at saying your daily prayers than I am. I often feel like I don't quite know uh, what prayer is. I just know that I do it and I need it. But then Maybe prayer isn't about being better. It's not about succeeding or achieving anything. It's not being about being uh, holier than anyone else. Increasingly, it feels to me like saying our prayers day by day it slowly teaches us to trust that we really are held by that love which is always already present. That love which is waiting for us, whether we feel full of joy with our hearts burning within us. Or maybe just a bit tired or anxious or uncertain. Day by day, I think. Praying invites us to trust in that love. And so again, I invite you to make time for prayer this week. 
to make yourself present to that love and just see what happens. See what happens as you make space for that love in which we really are connected one to another and all of us with the life of creation. As you make yourself present to that love which holds all things in its hands and in which we can and will endure and believe and hope all things. Amen. And so we come now to our time of prayer. Uh, and this week, our prayers are written and spoken by June. And so, united in the spirit, let us make our prayers through Christ to God our Father. Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of the spring, for the sun and the flowers, trees and birds which cheer us even in this time of uncertainty and unrest. We thank you that even though we cannot worship together in our church building, we can come together in spirit as a community through online services and by telephone. We pray that this confinement to our homes may give people the opportunity to reflect more on their faith and to bring others to you. We pray for all those feeling lonely and cut off from friends and family. And thank you for the volunteers and neighbours helping the isolated and vulnerable with shopping and phone calls. We pray for those confined with violent and abusive partners or parents and that they may receive help. We pray that we may recognise what we are able to do for others to support and encourage during this difficult time, whether it is practical help, phone calls or prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all Christians, wherever they may be, for our archbishops, bishops and clergy, and especially today for the churches of St. Thomas and St. Edmund in Salisbury, and clergy, Kelvin Inglis, Wendy Cooper, Selina Deacon. We give thanks for completion of the latest phase of the reordering and renovation of St. Thomas's church. We pray for St. Thomas's, welcoming, praying, transforming in the centre of the city. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem and the Middle East. The Most Reverend Michael Lewis, Archbishop of Jerusalem and the Middle East, and Bishop of Cyprus and the Gulf. In our own church, we thank you for Helen and Lyndon and the LPAs as they seek ways to reach out to the church members and help those in need. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for Patrick and Val, George, Teresa, Nick, Oliver and Emma, Astrid, Daphne, Don and Betty, Eric, Gwen and Peter, Kay, John, Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask your blessing on St John's and the other churches in Broadstone. The churches together in Broadstone prayers come from St Anthony's this month. They, this week they ask us to pray for Broadstone's doctors, nurses and everyone who works in the NHS. We pray for those who work in our emergency services and social services. We pray for all key workers, transport and postal workers, shop workers and those delivering our food. We pray for protection against the coronavirus and that they have adequate protective equipment. 
In preferral affected by COVID-19, those in hospital or care homes and their families who cannot be with them. And for those who have lost loved ones recently. We pray for our local traders that they may be able to access financial help to help them through the lockdown. And for people working from home whilst looking after children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the Queen and Royal Family, for the Prime Minister and Members of Parliament and local councils, that they make the right decisions when to ease restrictions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick and the families and friends of those who have died recently, including Edward, Shirley, Hilma, Walt and Doris, remembering your promise of eternal life for those who trust in you. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In Holy Week, Bishop Nicholas said that when he prays the Lord's Prayer at the moment, he started holding his hands as if he were at the communion rail, as a sign that whilst we may not be able to receive the gift of bread at the moment, we can still receive other gifts from God every day. And so I invite you to join me now in this gesture as together with Christians around the world and through all the ages, we pray the words which Jesus gave us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So friends, with that, today's service of the Word draws to a close. A huge thanks to June for the prayers uh, and also to everyone who sent in pictures, not only of their gardens this week, but also of the prayer spaces they've made at home. Please do keep those images coming in. They're a real joy to receive and to share. As we go into this next week, can I just assure you all now that Helen and I continue to pray for all of you and we're here if you need us for anything. But for now, uh, be well, be kind to yourselves and to one another. And stay in peace, friends, to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>